Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar with Dr. Amy on caregiving during a pandemic, the impact on families. My name is Amanda Richards, and I'm the Director of Business Development and Community Integration at Chartwell Retirement Residences. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. The presentation today will be recorded and will be sent to those of you who subscribe to our email list, but I encourage you to stick around because Dr. Amy is going to be answering any questions you have live after the main presentation. If you have any questions, you can submit them in the comments section and we'll do our best to address them. Uh, also due to the pandemic, you'll notice today that Dr. Amy is going to be presenting from her home. So please excuse us if there's any interruptions in Wi-Fi or barking dogs or the UPS guy at the door. Uh, we're all doing our very best during these trying times. So now I have the absolute pleasure of introducing today's guest speaker, Dr. Amy Dupuis. Dr. Amy is a gerontological social worker with over 30 years of experience. She's an accomplished author of two books, uh, a professional speaker and a life coach. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Amanda. I'm really happy to be with you and with all of you today. And I'm excited about the content of this presentation because what I hope is that it really eases the burden for many of you. And during these especially difficult times, we all need to have the burden uh, eased. So I'm gonna jump right into the presentation here. I'm so happy to be with you to talk to you about a topic that is really vital right now, and that's about caregiving during a pandemic. You know, the challenges are immense for all of us who are going through this pandemic, but when you add in the extra layer of what it's like to be a caregiver during this, it can be completely overwhelming. I'm hoping that's not true for you. But let's talk about what the experience can be like right now, because perhaps you're living with the person you're caring for, or you may not be, but you may be really concerned about going to visit them because you don't want to get them sick. And you're also worried that if you get sick, who's going to be there to care for them? That's a big concern. And you may be worried right now that they just don't have enough socialization. They're too isolated. It can be a very lonely time for people right now. And of course, Everything I'm talking about is about the impact on the person you love, but it's also about the impact on you. So if your person you're caring for is, feel, is isolated, my guess is that you're feeling a lot of stress right now because of that. And you may be worried just about things like that they're not eating well enough, and is that a problem? And you may be worried that they need more care than they're getting. So you're worried about the physical health implications right now of them being alone, but also the emotional and mental health implications of that. This is a lot. And I just want to acknowledge that it is not an easy time. You know, when you think about it, there's a big impact on you as a caregiver. And here you see some of the emotions that you might be feeling. Now, I want to say, if you're feeling any of these emotions, it's perfectly normal to have them. You're not a bad caregiver if you're feeling angry or frustrated. It's never about the emotion. It's about what we do with the emotion. So I want you to, to just be able to acknowledge that you may be feeling a lot of different things, and certainly overwhelmed is one of them. Now, you might be feeling guilty for things like you can't get there to even help your parent with maybe their tech issues. A lot of us end up being tech support for our aging parents. And you know, more and more older adults are using tech very successfully, but it changes all the time. And you may be the one who gets the call about why isn't the iPad working or even just their cell phone, what's going on with that. So as you think about your overwhelm and your guilt and perhaps your frustration, at the situation and what's going on and frustration about how it is as a caregiver, I'm guessing there may also be some impacts on you and on your health. Maybe you're having more headaches than you've had, or you're not sleeping very well, or you're having upset stomachs or grinding your teeth. And my guess is you could probably add to this list. Now, the truth is, I, I'm not here to just empathize with you. 
right? I don't want you to just say, well, she gets what I'm going through. Let's see if we can't come up with some real solutions for you that will make life a bit easier during this time. And also add to the quality of life of the person that you love. I really want to say to you that seeking out help does not make you weak. It actually makes you strong to be the one who seeks out help. So don't hesitate whether the help is just attending this, this presentation and the others that Chartwell is going to do or seeking out other help. It's a sign of strength. So what we want to talk about today is we want to talk about things from the standpoint of emotionally and practically, what are some things you can do? And some of this will be about for you and some will be about your loved one to get us all through this. Because right now in this lockdown that we're in right now, I, everybody I talk to is telling me that this one seems to be so much harder even than last spring. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Because we're now we're in the throes of winter. We've been through this, what feels like over and over again. And the end is not very near. We can see that this is gonna go on for a while. And I think that that makes it very hard. Okay, so let's talk about some practical things that I know are going on. One of the things that I know is going on is that people are delaying seeking solutions. What I mean by that is they're saying, I just have to get through this pandemic and then we'll figure out what's best for mom or for dad or for my spouse, whatever it is. And I wanna really encourage you to take action. And that's what this is going to be about today. And this action is about exploring solutions and then hopefully putting them into practice. Okay. So you may have found that what's become obvious for you is that your parents' living situation is not ideal right now. You're, one of the things I think has happened for lots of people is the pandemic has actually highlighted isolation and perhaps what that means in terms of safety and socialization and support. And so we have to step up if that's the case. We can't just say, oh, we'll get through it and then we'll figure it out. You know, even if you're close by, you may realize that because of the pandemic and this could happen in other situations, it's hard to be there for them in the ways that you want to. So I wanna want you to ask yourself, is your loved one in the best right now, the best living situation they could be in? Is it ideal? And if you're saying to me, no, it's not ideal, then let's talk about what you can do about that. And I say safety is always first. So let's talk safety. Many people, as I'm saying, realize their parent really isn't safe in the way they want them to be right now, fully safe. So if that's the case, you cannot ignore safety ever. Even during a pandemic, we have to talk about it. And we have to look at safety in lots of different ways. What does it mean to be safe? It's not just isolated away where you're not gonna get the virus because that may not be safe at all from lots of other standpoints, okay? So let's make sure that safety is looked at in a very broad sense, not just in a little isolated sense. And you may be worried again and have to look at that your parents' health is perhaps suffering because of this. So what we wanna talk about is a long-term plan. And how do you go about making that? And how do you start actioning that? And again, I wanna remind you, this isn't just about your loved one, this is about you. One of the things I say frequently is, a solution that is good for one person in the family or one person in a situation at, and, and not good for anybody else is actually not a sustainable solution. It may seem okay in the beginning, but it will not work out in the long term. So whatever solutions we look at, we wanna make sure they're good for everybody in your life, not just you, not just your parent, but everybody. So making a long-term plan. Remember I said, we're gonna talk about things from an emotional standpoint and a practical standpoint. The emotional standpoint, I really do believe that as we start moving through the vaccination process, as we start getting out of lockdown, which I know could still be a while, but you know, as weather changes and things improve that way, I think the emotional will improve along with that. So practically, we wanna look at this in, in even more detail right now and ask yourself, what type of a plan do you need to consider right now, not waiting, not putting it off to ensure safety and quality of life for you and for your loved one? 
So to figure that out, I've got a few suggestions for you. First of all, Chartwell's running a series that I think you should take advantage of. Uh, they're free workshops and they will help you sort things out. And they're gonna look at exploring possible solutions. What could that be? What kind of care and living arrangements are available that you should be considering? And help you weigh those risks and benefits of each one. That will be a big help because most of us don't know all of the solutions and what the risks and benefits are. It also may help you in your thinking process and help you inform conversations with loved ones. Now, I like to talk about these conversations as essential conversations. And I say that an essential conversation is talking to uh, the people we love about the things that are most important. So what are the most important things that you need to be talking about with the people who are most important in your life? And this is about including them in the conversation. It's not about having conversations around people. And you know what it's about? It's about an open, honest conversation with the person that you're caring for. And, and I know for some people, there's a hesitancy to that and concern. And certainly if there's significant memory loss, this may be a little harder, but as much as possible, you always wanna have the conversation with your loved one and with co-caregivers, what I mean by that is family members who are involved in this. I actually, I'll tell you a little bit more about who I think should be included in these conversations on the next slide, but that's an important consideration about who you are going to include. And you know, you can do these conversations virtually. Actually, sometimes there's a benefit to doing it virtually. You may think, how could there be a benefit? There's something about having these conversations and if possible on something like Zoom or FaceTime, whatever, about having conversations where we can see each other still, but there's a little bit of physical distance. Sometimes it's easier to talk about the tough stuff in those ways. So you don't all have to be in the same room at the same time to have these conversations. So what are you going to talk about? You want to talk about things like, what are your concerns? What, what's this been like for you? In addition to what do you think has been working and not working for your loved one. Of course, you're getting their input on this as well. And what are possible solutions? That's what we're looking at. So what's working, what's not working, what's everybody's experience been like? Those are the kind of things that you wanna be talking about. And then of course, the solution part is a key part of this. Uh, I wanna share with you uh, a couple of stories as we do this about essential conversations that I know have gone well for lots of people that I've worked with and, and how to make them more effective. So let's start with how do you make them more effective? Well, the first thing you wanna say is who should be involved in the conversation? So I have a few ways I think about this. You know, this is very individual to your family setup. So you wanna think about, I, I, I make a joke about in some families, in-laws are outlaws, so you don't include them. In other families, in-laws are just like the adult children and they're involved in everything. So you want to con consider and include anybody who is, is going to be involved in the care and in the situation. So again, this includes your aging parent. And I'm saying parent, but I'm using that kind of generically to the older loved one in your family. You could be the spouse, you could be, it could be your aunt or uncle we're talking about, but you want to include them. So whoever is going to be involved or impacted by decisions that get made. And there's a third category, anybody who might be a disruptor to a plan. And you may think, I want to include the disruptor. Yes, because what happens, we, we all know who these people are in our family. They're the person who comes in after a plan's been created, maybe even implemented, and they disrupt it because they never were involved and they see things differently. So we want them involved right from the beginning because they're much less apt to disrupt if they've been part of the plan from the start. Okay, and then you see there, give notice. Now, I'll tell you a story. I was a caregiver for a decade for my parents and my dad and I have very different styles. He is somebody who needs a lot of time to think about things. And I tend to think about things pretty quickly in the moment. And here's what I found with my dad. And this is why I recommend this for all families. I would go, I'd be thinking about something he and I needed to talk about. And then I'd go visit him 
And I'd walk in his house and I'd kind of say, you know, dad, I think we should talk about such and such. Well, he hadn't been thinking about this. I had been thinking about this. And so what would happen is he'd get a bit overwhelmed. So what I realized is by telling him ahead of time, you know, I'm thinking about whatever it is, and maybe you and I should have a chat about that. And he, he would then have a chance to mentally and emotionally prepare for our conversation. The difference this made was remarkable. And, you know, think about it. If somebody walked into your house and kind of started talking to you about some major conversation that needed to be had, and they had given you absolutely no notice, how would you react to that? I'm guessing, like my dad, you might not like it. And, you know, as fast as I think on my feet, I wouldn't like it either. So make sure that you get that ahead of time. Give notice. And then set a time that you're going to talk. And involve, now, sometimes people will say, I need to talk to my parent first alone, and then I'll include other people. It all depends on your family. So think about what would work. Sometimes, let's say there are three adult children in your family, and, and you decide to all go talk to your parent at the same time. Sometimes that's overwhelming. It feels like they're, someone's being ganged up on, even though that's not the intention, that's how it can feel. So does this need to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation and then you bring in other people or do you include everybody right from the start? Those are the things you want to give some thought to. So you've set the time, you go over. Now, here is the best opener to a conversation. Mom, dad, I want you to know that the reason I want to talk about this with you today is I want to support your independence and quality of life. I'm here to support that, not take it away. Now imagine that a conversation starts like that and the difference it makes to someone versus, I, and these are honest things, I've worked with lots of families over the 30 years plus I've been doing this, and people will walk in and they often talk to their parents like their parents are adolescents that are not behaving well. Uh, I'll tell you a story that I one time had a guy tell me that he wanted to talk to his dad about driving. And what he did was he walked into the father's house and he grabbed the father's keys and he said, so you're done driving now. And I was stunned that I said, well, how did your dad react to that? And he said, not very well. And I chuckled and I said, well, I'm wondering if I walked in your house and took your car keys and said, you're done driving, how would you react? And he said, well, that's ridiculous. There's no reason for me not to drive. And I said, and that's exactly what your dad thinks. So think about the approach because when we tell someone, I'm here to support your safety, your independence and your quality of life, it's a very different message than if we walk in and start saying, this just isn't working and we need to talk about a new solution because I'm stressed out and I'm worried about you immediately people are on the defensive. Now, it, you may say, well, I would never do that. It's a normal thing in families to approach conversations like that. So what I'm suggesting is not the normal approach that most people have. Okay, so expressing yourself. Now there's an opportunity to also share how you're feeling about what's going on. And again, these conversations aren't necessarily easy. I remember one that I had with my dad where this is very early on in my caregiving of my parents. My mother had had a massive stroke. She needed a lot of care. And my dad uh, was living, they were living together, but he couldn't provide the care, but he was the stability that allowed us to have care for my mother. And I'm gonna share later how we ended up moving them to retirement living, and this made it a lot easier. But at this point, they were still in their own home. It was uh, a little isolated. And my dad was the healthier of the two, although I have to be honest with you, he also had a lot of frailty. So what did my father do? He decided to get on a ladder and clean out the, the eaves. Now, my dad had a balance issue from the time he was a young man. So this was a very risky move. There was nobody there. And when he told me he did this, I had to tell him how I felt about that that I was really concerned. And I also was upset with him because if something happened to him, who was going to take care of my mom and be there for her? And I talked to him about the fact that what he did and what all of us did now had much more of an impact on each other's lives than it did previously 
because we were all interconnected in this caregiving scenario. You know, that was a hard conversation, but he needed to know how much that impacted me. And he and I had a really open conversation. And, you know, in that case, he did, he did get it. And sometimes I had to have reminder conversations over the decade, you know, what we all do now impacts each other differently. So expressing how you feel is an important part of this, but it's doing it in a loving way. And then of course, what you want to make sure that you do is you're talking about solutions and you want to make sure you leave lots of space for your aging parent to talk about what matters most to them. So I always say, start there and say, you know, if I'm here to support your quality of life and your safety, I want to know what is it that you want? What feels like quality of life to you? What makes you feel safe? Then you can express yourself and then talk about potential solutions. Now, here's the thing. You may not know what the solutions are to this. You may really need to go out and do some exploration. And if that's the case, that's okay. What you can all do in this conversation is identify what needs to be explored. What information do you need to have in order to make a good decision? I always say that essential conversations are not a one and done. What you wanna do is open the door to more conversations. And the way to do that is to have a smaller, effective conversation rather than one huge conversation where things go awry. I'm sure you can see the, the benefit of doing that instead of having something, I, I say don't have a kitchen sink conversation where everything gets thrown in. Keep it rather confined, you know, you know what the, the defined, not confined about what the conversation is gonna be. That's the key. Now you'll see on, on the slide, it says, set the next meeting. This is an important part of it because setting the next meeting means that everybody gets to go away. They need to, they get a chance to think a little bit more and some of us process slower than others. And we need time to really think about what was talked about and we may need to explore solutions. And then we come back and you have a second meeting. Now, when I say meeting, that sounds very formal. We don't mean that a second conversation, except second, you know, what's our next step? How do we move forward with this? But the goal here is what I just said. It is absolutely to move forward and not to get stuck and not move things because we're in the midst of a pandemic. If anything, we need to get moving now because solutions take time to implement. We don't just do that overnight. It takes some time. Okay, so let's talk about retirement living and say, is this a potential solution in your family or not? So I wanna tell you the story about my parents and how for me, this was a huge help. So I mentioned to you, my parents were living in their house and they were quite isolated. And my mom needed a lot of care after she had her stroke. And my dad wasn't able to provide it, but he could be there. And I was concerned about their isolation. And my dad understood that and he was concerned too. I was also worried about the fact that if my mom passed before my dad did, that my dad was going to be alone in a house where the only people he saw were my mom. And when she went, they'd be gone. And I was worried what that would mean for my dad. And I was worried about three things. I was worried about their safety. I was worried about their socialization. And I was worried about them having enough support in their lives. So let's, let's talk about those. Because when I moved them to retirement living, and I didn't move them without their input and permission, that was a family discussion I had with my parents. And my mom wasn't able to weigh in, but my dad was. And to be able to talk about why this might be a good solution. And, you know, initially he was a little reticent about doing this. But I'll share with you something that can be very helpful. A lot of times people will do things for someone they love that they wouldn't do for themselves. So my father left to his own devices would not have moved into retirement living. But when I presented it about why I saw this as a huge benefit to my mother and to her care, he immediately agreed because he was so committed to her and her care. Sometimes it'll be that you can tell an aging parent how much this is impacting you, the caregiving from afar, and that will motivate them. Now, I don't mean about doing this in a manipulative way. I mean about being honest. And sometimes people just will act more quickly when it benefits someone they love than they will if it benefits only themselves. 
So when my parents got into this living situation, it went exactly as I thought it would. First of all, I felt that they were much safer because remember there was care coming in for my mom, but it was only there a couple of hours a day. Now I knew there were people around all the time if something happened. I knew they were safe. If there was an emergency, they were safe. There was support all the time. If you know my dad had something, my mother occasionally would, would have a, a, something happen in her wheelchair and he couldn't get her out. There was somebody there to help with that. Somebody besides me to go do this or me to contact someone to do it. There was a great sense of reassurance. And I found not just for me, but my dad relaxed once they got in there, which made me so happy. And then the socialization part, you know, they, they were surrounded by people who were in kind of like circumstances and, you know, different, but similar. And my dad, who was not a very social man, met lots of people easily. So suddenly now his life improved. Now I know we're in a pandemic and you may say, well, there's no socialization. There is a lot of support going on in retirement living right now uh, among the residents and people really still having a lot of contact. So that that hasn't disappeared in the pandemic. It's not as easy, obviously, but there is still that element going on. And then the third part of it is that word support. So maybe your loved one needs someone to come in morning or night to check on them. Maybe there's medication management that needs to, to happen, or maybe there's some memory issues and they need a little bit more. That's there. And what I found with my parents was my dad relaxed and my mother, because he was more relaxed, also seemed happier to me. And my mother did pass before my dad. And one of the nicest parts of this story was that my dad was surrounded by people who supported him through that grief and he had wonderful relationships that continued for the next several years while he was alive. And had he been in that former house, he would have been completely isolated and there would have been no one. I was so relieved that we made the decision when we did and that we put an action plan into place. So I, I wanna stress, get the facts, because right now I know there's a lot of concern about safety and retirement living. I understand that. And I know there's lots of media stories about it. I'm going to encourage you to get the facts for yourself. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. First of all, talk to the people at the residence that you're looking at. And if you're considering a Chartwell residence, talk to the, the, the person who is the coordinator there and ask them to connect you with families of people who are living there. I don't think there's any better way to get information than from the families of actual residents and the residents themselves too, but you know, people in your circumstance, I think it's an, a fabulous way to get accurate information and for you to be able to weigh pros and cons, benefits and risks for yourself. That's the goal here. Okay, so what can you do in the short term? And you know, the short term is while we're going through all this, what can you do? Well, one of the things you can do is maintain frequent and consistent contact with your loved one because we know that in some level of activity is really important, but you know what? It's not just important for them. It's important for you. So I want you to think about what do you need as a caregiver to get through this? And one of the things I think is key on the emotional front is to figure out who is the person who can be what I call a thought partner with you. Somebody who is maybe not in your family that can be the person might be a very close friend who can help you think through options, who can be there to help you weigh risks and benefits, what matters, all of those kind of things. And then the other part of this is to think about who could go through the fire with you. And what I mean by that is we all need someone who will walk through difficult times with us. And so you need to think about how you do that, walking through the difficult times. And who could that be? Is it a best friend? Could be your sibling? Could be uh, somebody that you know is a caregiver and who's going through a similar circumstance and you can kind of be there for each other as you have these conversations, but you need support as you go through this. Now, some of you may say, I don't want to reach out. What I want to do is cocoon. I'm an introvert. Let me go in to kind of into myself. And, and I, if I could just be an introvert and live in my introverted world for a while, I can recharge. That's okay too. So you have to know who you are in this, but Support if you need it, and most of us need it, at least in some form, 
And then what else you need for self-care is key. On the practical front for yourself, one of the things I think has been most challenging during the pandemic is the fact that every day can feel like blurs day, right? Just one day after another day after another day. So what can you do for yourself to make that better? For many people, it's establishing a routine. I just had a conversation the other day with a psychologist who told me she's recommending to all of her clients, they get up, they take a shower, they do some things that are kind of markers, the day is starting. They look at the calendar to figure out what day it is if they don't know. And they, they create some routines that create structure that help divide up the days within the day and the specific days. So I encourage you to do that. The other thing I encourage you to do is to pull on your team, whoever they are. Now, for a lot of people, they, they think about their caregiving team in kind of a small way. I want you to think about expanding it a little bit. So here's a way you can do that. Are there distant, more distant family members who could be providing some of that frequent and consistent contact, mm -hmm. phone calls to your parent, or perhaps even um, getting on FaceTime. I always think if you can do anything that you can see people gives more a sense of connection. Also think about, do you have friends who uh, are have a relationship with your parents? They know your parents and they have a good relationship. Doesn't mean they're close, but could they reach out and chat with your parents and be a different voice? So both of my parents are gone, but I have lots of friends who are caregivers right now. And I am doing that with several of my friends where on a regular basis, I pick up the phone and I call their parents and have a chat. Now, it's not taking up a great deal of my time, but I can tell you, I can hear in, in their voices how happy they are to have some contact. And my friends are relieved because it both gives them a break, but just makes them feel better. They're less stressed because they know their parents are having a bit more contact and I'm loving it. I'm having conversations with people I may not have connected with in years. So think in your life, who could that be? Who could that be? Is there anybody you could reach out to? So the goal here is by doing the practical and also attending to your emotional, that things are better for you, right? And for your parent. Remember, this isn't just about one person. It's not just about them. It's not just about you. This is really about how does everybody survive better during this time? Okay. So you may be saying, I'm going to wait. It's natural. It's natural to put this on hold. And again, I'm going to encourage you don't put this on hold because putting it on hold is delaying solutions and delaying what could be a better quality of life for you and for your parent and greater uh, support for them and more safety. So take, hit play, stop pausing and encourage that you do. I'm going to encourage you to do a few things. Have the essential conversations you need to have. Explore the options that you need to explore and then put some sort of a plan in motion. Here's the beauty of doing this. We know that when we're in action, it reduces our stress levels. What increases stress levels is when we feel we have no control. So this is about taking more control, feeling better about what you're doing, feeling like you're there for your parent, but also there for yourself. And again, think about talking to a retirement living consultant at the Chartwell residence you're considering and also asking to speak to family members so you can get the true story right now about what's going on and, and be able to assess for yourself risks and benefits and safety for your parents. I know that caregiving at any time is a huge, huge responsibility. There's wonderful parts of caregiving. You know, when you're caregiving, you're, you're, you, you get to have more time with people that you love. You get the opportunity to, to have stories shared that maybe you haven't heard in a long time. You have an opportunity to bring out your best qualities of nurturing and warmth and care. And you have an opportunity to look into your own future. And so think about yourself. Think about your parent. What will help you maximize this time where you're a caregiver in probably one of the most stressful times any of us have ever experienced in our life? Do what it takes to move forward so that this experience for you ends up being a positive experience during the pandemic and that when it's over, you don't then have to play catch up because you don't have any plans in place. 
Now is the time to make those plans. Don't hesitate to make them. And I wish you all the best. I'm going to turn you back now to Amanda, who's going to share some more information with you. And Amanda, I'm going to turn this over to you right now. So before we get into some participant questions for Dr. Amy, which we still have uh, some time to submit if you haven't already submitted your question, I'd like to sincerely thank Dr. Amy for her wonderful and insightful presentation today. If you'd like to learn more from Dr. Amy, I invite you to visit Chartwell's website, chartwell.com, and explore our library of blogs and videos by Dr. Amy. She discusses everything from how to start the conversation with a loved one to how to get on the same page as your siblings or a spouse and many other common caregiving challenges. We consider ourselves very fortunate to be partnering with her to bring you these important topics to Canadian caregivers. For those of you who have just begun exploring retirement living at Chartwell and you're ready to learn more about the lifestyle and how it can help you or a loved one, we have a team of knowledgeable representatives who are available to answer your questions and guide you in the right direction. You can call or email us today at the information provided on your screen. And for those of you who've already been actively researching retirement living, and perhaps you've already taken an in-person or a virtual tour of one of our homes, now is the perfect time to get in touch with the Chartwell Retirement Living Consultant to book another discussion or another personalized tour. So now we're going to take some questions for Dr. Amy. All right, so Dr. Amy, a couple of questions have come through um, our channels here. And the first one is, I have three siblings. Should I involve them all in the first essential conversation with my mom? <laughs> That's a very good one, Amanda, because you know, I, I want you to think about how that might feel for your mom, sorry to say. And you know, this is the thing about when we talk about essential conversations, we have to remember that every family situation is unique. So you have to know your family and what would work best. But I'll tell you that when you think about if, if, if you all came in to chat with your mom at the same time, she might feel a little bit like you're ganging up on her rather than supporting her. That can overwhelm people a little bit. So if, if you think that could be true in your family, think about who might be the best a one of all of you to maybe start the conversation with your mom and then suggest that the others join in. And again, now in your family, it might work to bring everybody together at once, but likely it would be better to have one person start that essential conversation and then bring in other family members. I think that's really uh, great advice. And I have a feeling that in my own particular situation, I would be the one who would be voluntold to have that first conversation. <laughs> with my mom, so. but that really was true in my suggestion. family too, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question I, I think uh, resonates with a lot of people. So the question says, I feel a lot of guilt for considering a retirement residence for my dad when he expects to move in with my, me and my family so I can provide all his care but I work and I don't have room on the main floor for a bedroom for him and he can't do the stairs. Uh, what do I say to him? Yeah, this is a tough one. You know, guilt is a very common caregiver emotion. I have to tell you that I would say almost, it is almost universal when I talk to a caregiver that they describe something they feel guilty about. So I'm sorry you're feeling that. I want you to know you're not alone in feeling guilty. Um, it's always about different things. But then let's talk about your specific situation. You know, one of the things that I really believe is that as caregivers, as people, you know, family members who love the people we're caring for, our job isn't to provide all the care. It's to make sure that our loved one gets the best care possible, which is a different situation. So if you can remember that, that might help alleviate a little bit of your guilt. And then let's talk about the situation with your dad. Now, you mentioned that he expects to move in with you and your family. Um, oftentimes, I just want to say that sometimes we think our parent wants that. And in actuality, it, they, they don't. So make sure you're not just assuming that. And then now let's assume that he actually does want to move in with you. I, I'm hearing that set up. And it doesn't sound like it's good for anything. And another thing I say is that you know the solution that's good for one person in a family at the expense of other people is not a good solution and it's not sustainable. You'll hear me say that over and over again. And so this is not a sustainable solution. You can not possibly manage all the care of your dad while you're working and your house isn't set up for that. 
So the conversation I think that you want to have with your dad is about the fact that you really support his independence and quality of life. You want to make sure that he has the best living situation possible. You can explain why this isn't the best living situation for everybody, including him. And then I think you have an opportunity to talk to him about some of the benefits of living in a retirement residence and what that might be like for him. Now, the other thing you can do is assure him that you're still going to have lots of contact with him. And in actuality, you'll get to do more fun things together because you'll have the opportunity to be there to just enjoy time with him versus having to to make sure that, you know, he's safe and that he has socialization and that there's security. Because if he does choose a retirement residence, he'll be getting those things there. So it's an opportunity, I think, for an open, honest, essential conversation about what will work for everyone, making sure he has the best care possible, but that also your relationship gets to continue in the best way possible. Thank you so much for that. I think that mm -hmm. uh, you know, really resonates with everyone and we often feel this sense of, of guilt. And so that's oh. uh, fantastic advice. The, the next question is a little bit of a, a hot topic for us right now. Um, with all the negative media about long-term care, my brother thought that it was a terrible idea that I suggested a retirement residence for my mom. Uh, he doesn't really understand the difference. And he made me feel really guilty, but I'm the one providing all of her care, so I feel like that's unfair. What should I say to him to make him realize that it's not what he thinks it is and that this is just too much for me? Well, this is definitely an essential conversation. And, <laughs> and you hear there's guilt again coming up. And you know, a lot of times when we are the primary caregiver in a caregiving family, our siblings aren't even aware of how much we're doing. And it's not that they don't care. It's just, you know, unless they're involved in it, they're not seeing how much this really takes to do. So I, I understand right now, a lot of people have concerns and certainly there's a lot of media attention that, that adds to our concerns. So I, you know, you've heard me say this in the presentation, I'll say it again, get the facts. So I would recommend calling the retirement residence that you're, you may be considering and when for your mom. And when you do that, get the information about how have they been managing during COVID? What are they doing for safety precautions? And you might make this call first and get the information and then involve your brother or ask your brother to speak to the same thing. Again, you can also ask to talk to family members of people living there so you get some assurance about how has it been for the family as well as for the person living in the retirement residence. When you have the facts, you can weigh benefits and risks in a different way. And it's understandable your brother doesn't understand the difference between long-term care and retirement residence. Many people don't, but you have the opportunity to really help him here be better informed by going to the source of information directly and making sure you get the facts from them. And again, I'm suggesting multiple ways to get those facts, family members, as well as from the staff at the retirement residence. I, I love that advice. And, uh, and for everyone listening as well, next week's webinar, we're actually gonna talk a lot about the differences between long-term care and retirement and a lot of the measures yeah. that have been put into place in retirement residences uh, to keep everybody safe. So uh, a really great suggestion also to reach out to those retirement living consultants at the specific home that you're considering mm -hmm. and ask those questions, so important. Great, and then I have a, uh, one last question here for you. Um, my biggest fear is that I move my dad into a retirement residence and he gets sick and it will be all my fault. But on the other hand, I feel like he's not doing well at all by himself and he has a lot of depression and anxiety because he's always alone. What should I do? This is a very tough situation. You know, it, it's, uh, it, there, there is a very wise person who has, happens to work at Chartwell who really one time said to me something that I hadn't ever thought about even in all my years as a gerontologist which is that it's interesting we celebrate people being alone in the later years. We'll say, good for you, you're still living on your own. And oftentimes people are lonely and isolated and prone to depression. And so we wanna reframe that and start looking at what's the best living situation here for your dad? What would help deal with all of these situations? Now, I understand your fears. Again, we just talked about it. So I'm gonna go back and say, get the facts and you know, make sure that you do that. And then you know, there, there is this, this thing that we, we don't have the ability to keep anyone 100% safe. 
unless we sort of lock them in a bubble, right? And that'd be the only way. And, and the, the consequences of that are very negative. It would be increased depression, increased anxiety, increased social isolation. So you want to be able to weigh the risks and benefits. And you want to say to yourself, how, how are you going to make sure your dad has the best overall situation? So, uh, you know, one of the benefits that you said, retirement living is the idea that people have socialization. They have people around them. They have that idea of security and they have safety. And as I said, I really found this with my own parents. And, and it's a relief for you as a caregiver, but it's also a relief for that person to be able to interact with other people and know there are people around. So I really want to encourage you to, to explore this, you know, and to, 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 to acknowledge your fears, but don't let them hold you back from exploring and making decisions that are in the best interest of your dad having what he needs. And of course, you want him to be part of this process. It's his life. So it's his decision to make ultimately, but you can help him by helping him explore and get the facts and, and see, you know, how would he weigh the, the, the pros and the cons of these situations? Oops. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy. That was really helpful advice. And I think a lot of people will be able to, uh, to relate to that question and, uh, and to that response. So thank you again for joining our presentation today. I hope that you'll consider joining us uh, next week for our, our next presentation, which is uh, comparing the health benefits of retirement living and aging at home. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you there on Facebook or YouTube Live. In closing, I'd like to share a heartwarming video with you featuring a Chartwell resident, uh, Mary, and her daughter, Teresa, who speak about their experience with Chartwell during the pandemic and why they wish they'd made the decision sooner. Thank you again, Dr. Amy, and to everyone, have a safe and happy rest of your week. Chartwell really works to incorporate the families into activities that are taking place so that my mom feels that she has a community here but she's not isolated from her family as well. My name is Teresa and my mother lives at Chartwell. I would definitely recommend Chartwell to anyone that is thinking of putting their loved one into a residence. Think of it as putting them into a community. Had I lived in my home where I came from, I wouldn't have had the community that I have here. It turned out to be a home away from home. I can tell you, and I'm sure my mother can attest to it as well, that she wishes she was here sooner. The staff at Chartwell and how they interact with my mom on a daily day basis, it's very important because they see her more than I do. It's just incredible how helpful everybody is. I've experienced Chartwell and this is where I, I think that you would be very happy. Uh, we're safe. The, the, the administration has us totally protected. If you have a situation, you phone them down to the main desk and they'll look after it for you if you can't go down yourself. She feels like she's at home at Chartwell.